so I'm just keeping an eye on things here, for Laura, to make sure that we're in. It says um, it's streaming live. Yeah, uh, I can't quite see it in the group yet, but we may well be. You never know. I think we're there. Good. <laughs> uh, good. We're in. We're in. Good. How are you, Laura? I'm fine. And I want to say thank you to everyone uh, who sent such warm and supportive messages um, after my recent unfortunate accident where I was doing sheep shearing and I tripped. <laughs> so sheep wrangling can be dangerous to your health. <laughs> well, I was thinking about arranging some cancellation insurance for this one, just in case, but we got here, so that's great. I was going to say, how are you? And, um, you know, many who are listening now will know we had to kind of postpone a little bit while you got over your uh, yeah. little tumble with the sheep. Yep. We can blame the sheep, right, Laura? So that's fine. It's, it's all their fault. Always their fault. <laughs> Uh, also, over here in the UK, uh, we've got this thing going on to do with football. Uh, I never quite saw the appeal myself, but uh, yeah, England are playing apparently. Uh, so um, thank you to those who are listening who are missing out on the football to listen to us instead, Laura. So that's fine. Um, oh, uh, I've been poor. This will resume straight away. Right. I think uh, there might be a little thing going on here. Bear with me, Laura. Uh, the video live has been interrupted. So what's all that about then? Let's have a look. What's going on? Right, bear with me, Laura. Uh, I'm just going to refresh that and have a look. So hopefully you guys can hear us uh, talking in. Uh, I don't know why it's saying it's been interrupted. What does that mean? Should resume shortly. Those are the messages you hate to hear. Uh, yeah, okay, no, I think, oh, I got you now. I think, right, so sorry, oh, good. Me. bear with me, guys. Uh, I can see what's happened. We've got, seem to have two connections in here for some reason. So um, I'm gonna get rid of that one and tell people. Bear with me a minute. Uh, right, okay. Uh, uh -huh, uh -huh. Good. That's why. Oh, we need somebody on the text. We need a better tech team, don't we, Laura? <laughs> We're all right now. I can see everybody. Okay, good. Um, right, good, Laura. So let's start. Uh, well, it's great to have you. So we have, we connected a little while ago, didn't we? And we've had a few great chats since then. Yeah. We first got together after the virtual dog conference. Yes. Uh, and I was blown away by your talk and it really fits. Um, I, I tried to have a bit of a join the dots, philosophical, definitely psychological look at how we need to rethink or reappraise, uh, throw that in now, uh, how, things. And um, your area your focus on looking at um slow thinking and cognitive reappraisal we'll go through all these things as we chat it just really hit me and um so i'm interested to know laura how did you come to this what's your what's your kind of journey where, where did you come into dogs and how did you start thinking about these different ways of thinking about how dogs need to be able to uh process what's going on around them well uh you know like like so many of us who are um, now do doing this as a profession, I first started this because of um, issues I was struggling with in my own life with my own dogs. Um, before I, you know, even knew, well, I knew of course what aggressive behavior was, but honestly, I didn't know that much about it. This is what, 15 years ago now. Um, and then I, I started living <laughs> with two dogs who decided they wanted to kill each other, right? And, and uh, th this, was, this was traumatic. It was stressful. It's one reason I can really empathize 
with people who are struggling with the same thing because for 10 years, I turned my house into a gated community. I had to micromanage just about every interaction of these dogs. I finally got them to a place where they could be in the same room and ignore each other. And to me, that, that was the major victory. But how did I get there? Well, first I tried the the usual you know it's the mantra well just do desensitization counter conditioning you know the usual kind of behaviorist solutions and guess what they didn't work <laughs> they i uh, they just were so lacking and i have since done research and discovered that you know uh counter conditioning for example works much better with humans than animals much less successful in animals. So I have to say my whole, everything I've done in the, you know, decade and a half since that time, um, it was spawned from desperation. <laughs> I mean, I was looking for solutions and I was not finding them, uh, in the, in what was offered at the time in the dog training world and so i had i had to just um actually in my case i had done some cognitive behavior therapy that that was you know part of what i've done over the last 20 20 years and i i just kept thinking okay well what worked for me <laughs> what worked for me maybe i could try that with my dogs and actually uh, I had much, much greater success using, um, you know, this kind of underlying principle. Well, if I can just change the way they think, slow it down, because everything was happening uh, just instantly. I mean, everyone who has worked with an aggressive dog or especially lived with one knows this heart stopping instant. You, you're looking and then all of a sudden, before you can even breathe, your dogs are fighting. Uh, it, it, so uh, finding a way to, you know, to break that up, slow it down, help them make different decisions um, instead of just jumping in, well, I, I'm gonna kill that other dog. Um, so, you know, I, I've told the story many times, but I think it's really important. This was not a, an intellectual <laughs> exercise for me. It was a survival uh, exercise. And it's interesting how you share it like that, because I think a lot of people, especially a lot of professionals, that shift comes when through what we learn through our own dogs, you know, because they, they yeah. are our biggest teachers and mentors. Um, uh, uh, the, the saying that, that I've heard a bit recently is, you know, the dogs are waiting because they're waiting for us to work it out, right? Yeah. Uh, uh, and uh, and especially when, you know, for me, um, I had a dog called Milo who, um, uh, you know, everything I kind of thought I knew, he just decided to let me know that I needed to throw that book out the window because, uh, and especially when we think about processing, um, Laura. Yeah. Uh, and about this, what we'll, we'll, we'll unpack a little bit more about the the benefits of slowing things down. But I talk a lot about um, things having internal value. We, we we use that term a lot in human psychology about the things that we actually have internal value for, for things that we've kind of worked out ourselves, right? Uh, and um, there's a, there's always a risk when we go diving in that we just we're just as reactive in the moment with our dog that they are. Uh, or that we make it all about the end result, which I think a lot of counter conditioning can end up falling into. You know, counter conditioning has its place, of course. And uh, I think um, if you can go through a process where you can break stuff down enough and have something that has internal value for the animal at the end of that, then it can it can help. Uh, but but I think um, uh, this thing that we tend to do when we just dive in or we start making it about that end behavior we're missing out on that, that dog's individual story about their truth that's mm -hmm. brought up to that. And, and I like that term about finding 
that truth because it's not necessarily the fact of what we see, it's the truth for them. Uh, the same as it's for us, you know, our own truths. We'll, we'll unpack it a little bit. So, yeah, so I think, I think a lot of people listening will really resonate with that because we learn so much through our own dogs and our own experiences. And so many amazing uh, colleagues have come into the industry on the back of them having this dog that they really need to support. And some of the things that are offered just don't seem to fit for that dog. Right, right. And I, especially lately because of the pandemic and um, first it was everybody adopting pandemic dogs and now uh, it's everybody returning <laughs> their pandemic dogs. Um, though, because partly um, there are just some difficult issues they have to deal with. But second, they haven't learned their dog's story. I love that uh, phrase. Um, you, you really have to, um, in, in some ways, talk to your dog. Of course, we can't talk linguistically, but through body language, through vocalization, through our communication with them, um, you can learn a lot about their story. And that is always the place to start. Uh, yeah. Rad- yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I just wanted to say rather than I, because that's not observable behavior. The, the story, their story is not really, I mean, you can tell some of it from their observable behavior, but there's more to it. And that is where we need to move beyond the traditional behaviorist paradigm, which really says, you know, it's the observable behavior and that's it. Uh, that's where we need to start. Yeah. I think that's the power of some of the discussions that we're having. And that's what I'm trying to do in the group by uh, you know, inviting amazing people like yourself in so we can look at some of the different aspects of this of what, what might make that dog's unique story. Um, and also, I think we have to be, uh, we can end up getting very focused and getting drawn in, as I said a moment ago, into that specific behavior and think, right, what's the function of that? without actually stepping back and thinking, right, what else can I learn about the dog before any of that? Mm-hmm. You know, what can I learn about this dog away from that? Mm-hmm. What can that dog tell me about how they process different things, uh, other parts of those, that dog's unique story that can actually help me uh, understand more about their own character and their own needs and their own ability to better process things. And I guess that's the kind of journey that you have to go on with your two dogs is to really break that down and find out what was going on for them as individuals, as well as what was going on in that relationship. Yes. Yeah. And it's one thing I try it's, I mean, for, for many reasons, but particularly for my own individual history with my own dogs, it it's, the reason that my behavior consulting practice focuses on dogs struggling with aggression, dogs and their humans, <laughs> because it it's just, if you're dealing with um, issues like aggression, you are also dealing with the human trauma and stress over this. Um, and so it, it always comes as a group effort, both the dog and the humans involved in the dog's life. And that's why I, Andy and I were talking just a little before we came live, um, that slow thinking needs to be for both part, both uh, partners in the team, <laughs> both the dog and the human. And that that can be actually, I think, much more difficult for the human than the dog. Um, and, I, and I think you're right there. And I think this, that, that, that comes down to us, I think, once we recognize some of these principles and extra factors that we have to build in as part of our support structure, is making sure that we get our language and our approach right with the client. Um, because, uh, you know, we were talking again off air about the role of belief systems and cognitive biases. I talk a lot about this stuff. It's, harking back to my human psychology days but uh, actually um uh, it's something we need to educate more about we need to understand that the the clients the carers experience with that dog they would have experienced a huge amount in that process that will have affected their own belief system about what's going on uh, that will affect their relationship with the dog and what they're seeing 
And whilst we can help them to manage situations to allow a more slower process for the dog so they can actually, as you call it, cognitively reappraise, they can find it harder to do that for themselves. <laughs> unless we yes. Them. Yes. And I, I have to say, uh, of course, I work on cognitive te teaching. It's a form of cognitive restructuring, right? Because that, I mean, and under that rubric fits many different uh, strategies, uh, ways to help dogs and people learn how to think differently. Um, but honestly, that is usually the first thing I'm doing with the humans. I, I really have to help them um, see their dogs differently, do some cognitive re uh, reappraisal because they are often so stressed. They just want it to stop. They just, uh, just stop, just, you know, teach my dog not to do this. Um, and they're often feeling quite resentful underneath. I mean, they did call me, that's good. So they're recognizing it's a problem, but underneath it's, it, there's often a strain of, why are you doing this to me? I feed you, I love you. <laughs> you know, you're in some cases they're biting the human or, and, and definitely up, up, um, setting the household routine, they're stressing people out. So I try to help humans see that this comes from a place of fear, stress, anxiety. Um, your dog is worried. Your dog, in some cases, can't really help what they're doing because of their genetics, uh, herding dogs. You know, if you have a dog that's reacting to fast movement, and it unfortunately means that they're actually chasing your kids and biting their heels, uh, well, that genetic predisposition is not going to go away. They need, you know, humans need to understand that. But what we can do is teach both the dog better ways, more, you know, more appropriate outlets for that what I call herding behavior run amok. Um, and I'm very familiar with that because I've had working border collies for 25 years and sheep. So I, I, I get herding behaviors run amok all the time. Um, but yeah, so both cognitive reappraisal, restructuring for both the human and the dog. And just to unpack, there's so many cool things there. And I think um, when we think about, uh, just to unpack some of that a little bit more, um, the, the carer will have experienced so much with their dog and the behavior that they find challenging. And, and quite often we're talking about things like guilt, shame, embarrassment, all these kind of things, anger. So it fits a mindset, but it fits a belief system for them to think that either their dog is somehow damaged or that there's this the behavior itself is something that has to change on its own. Uh, so that's why quite often they'll come to us expecting us to fix that or to do something to address that. And we have to help them to see actually that dog behavior is just as much as an expression of their emotional state than it, as it is for them. And I think um, the thing about cognitive appraisal, they're just looking at it from a human, for bringing a human psychology side a little bit, it's actually quite hard because the brain doesn't like to do it. You know, when we think about <laughs> the brain, um, uh, if the brain had to keep cognitively reappraising stuff, well, it'd probably explode, right? Because there's so many things to keep thinking about. So the, this is why we form those belief systems. And because uh, the, the brain likes to feel right, this is what I kind of feel about this. This is how I kind of want to keep that my view on it. Um, and it's a lot easier to have that. So uh, we do have to slow stuff down. We do have to think about the language that we use with uh, our clients to allow a, a good cognitive appraisal process that isn't just a cursory one. Uh, and of course, the issue I have a little bit with, especially going in with a with quite a heavy operant toolkit, even if it might work in that context, the carer's belief system probably hasn't changed. They still see behavior badly to change it, or they they don't necessarily 
have a, any more of an understanding about their dog's emotional care needs. They just have a better equipment now to change behaviors, you know? Mm -hmm. And I would also argue that animals have belief systems because I think, you know, I've had this discussion with people many times uh, verging on disagreements. But when you think about it, the, the belief system bit isn't a human thing. It's a, it's a very kind of um, basic brain thing to kind of decide, say, for the dog, what do I believe will happen when somebody comes near my food bowl? What do I believe will happen when somebody goes to grab my collar? You know, I think there is an element of that brain already having that. And a lot of these responses, uh, Laura, like you talk, said a moment ago, we have to remember for many of these responses for the dogs, they're reflexive. Yes. You know, these are not dogs who are thinking about it. There's not this, this notion of everything somehow a learned behavior. I, I would have exception with it a little bit because a lot of these behaviors that I call high, um, high active behaviors, the ones when that stress system, that nervous system really kicks in, they like to be reflexive. Um, uh, and if we're going to get ahead of that nervous system response, we have to ideally get the animal to a place where they can self-regulate better. Yes. So we have to get them to, like you describe it, cognitively reappraise uh, that kind of situation. And that's the challenge for us. Now, it'd be interesting, shame Kathy Murphy's not in the room. I don't know if Kathy's listening uh, now, but we could always do with a neuroscientist on hand at all times with these <laughs> conversations. But, uh, because uh, I'd be interested to know whether our big thinking brain gives us better chance to cognitive reappraise because we can step back if those cognitive biases that we have that protect our belief system are bypassed enough that we can actually think, oh, I'll need to rethink it. Or whether it's easier for the dogs who don't have to go through that process necessarily, the brain's just kind of like, okay, if you can let me process better and I can see a better outcome, then I'll go with it. It'll be interesting mm -hmm. to know what is the pros and cons either way for us differently as a species. Well, I would just say, um, and Kathy, if you're listening, I apologize because this is my very non-scientific view. I do think it's much easier for dogs. They are much more, I think, adaptive, resilient, and transparent <laughs> than us humans. That's partly why I'm working with dogs, right? Uh, I, lo I love that quality about them. Um, but I do think that, you know, what, what you're saying, this is how I um, kind of characterize it in my slow thinking as life-saving for dogs program. And that is fast thinking, fast twitch thinking, which is largely involuntary. Um, we, we don't have to process it. That's the whole characteristic of it. We couldn't live without it. You know, you pick up a fork to eat your food, that's fast thinking. The direction that you read print on a computer screen or a book, that's fast thinking. Deeply, deeply enculturated uh, habits of and muscle memory, uh, emotional memory, um, cognitive memory. So it's not that fast thinking is the villain, right? But also what fast thinking enables is exactly um, what you would call judgment biases. And in dogs, it is often uh, negative judgment biases, what I call cognitive distortions. Cognitive distortion is a, is a dog who every time they see another dog, they bark and lunge they growl, they try to, you know, bite it. They want to, they want to get to it because in their mind, every dog I see is dangerous, uh, is a potential, you know, um, actor for hurting me. Um, that is a distortion because it, it is a deeply habitual assumption. It's a judgment bias that we're making. And I actually was inspired for a lot of my work by anti-aggression, very successful anti-aggression programs that have been launched in uh, Los Angeles and Chicago for elementary school children, uh, who, these are kids who, if someone brushes them in the cafeteria line, 
you know, they maybe brush them a little, they're going to turn around and, and, and hit you because they automatically assume that person did it on purpose. They're not a friend to me. They're very hostile. I've got to retaliate. That is a cognitive distortion. And I think dogs do something similar. And we know there's actually significant, very significant cognitive parity between humans and dogs. We, you know, of course, dogs don't use uh, ling linguistics. They don't have at least verbal language, although vocalization is verbal. <laughs> so it's a certain kind of linguistic, but um, the mechanisms that humans and canines use to process information, to interpret it, to problem solve, these are all cognitive mechanisms. And so what I want is something after, after that moment when a dog sees another dog, I want to give them an alternate response to just assuming I see another dog, fast twitch thinking, that dog's going to hurt me. I need to, uh, you know, it's like the best uh, defense is a good offense. Uh, and when that becomes the dog's way of life, that's when you have a major issue. Um, so giving, giving the dog and, you know, humans in a different way, but giving the dog a way to look at the situation and reframe it. I, I wanna, I see the same situation because one of my mantras as a dog trainer is you can't control the environment. I mean, I guess you could if you wanted to live in a bubble, but most of us wanna go out. We wanna take our dogs out in public. You cannot control what other people do. Um, and even if you're in the moment yelling at them, put your dog on a leash. You know, and I'm sure many viewers have had this exact same experience. You can't control people because they're not doing it. And that dog is running up to you and either a fight ensues or an altercation or your dogs are barking and lunging. So I, I want to give dogs a way to problem solve. Uh, that's the slow thinking to reframe, reappraise, see that same situation differently, because honestly, I'm just not sure we can change the environment enough uh, to, you know, to make that a part of the solution. Uh, you can't control the environment. You cannot control what other people do. And I think this is, again, a bit to unpack there, and we'll come on to some of the practical applications of that in a second, but I think um, uh, this comes back to um, finding something that has internal value for the dog regarding that processing process, <laughs> uh, lots of processes, uh, but yeah, for them to be able to, as you say, cognitively reappraise. And I think this, there can be so many things that go into a response. You know, I think I, I think the whole aggression itself. I think a lot of the terminology we use around it isn't helpful uh, right. when we start thinking. I know we use them colloquially uh, because that's what we say. But I think um, recognizing that there is already a nervous system ready to take over in those situations. Mm. Uh, you know, and uh, uh, and there is a belief system that supports that. Mm -hmm. Even in, like with us humans, when we learn something new, we tend to do it slowly, we build up the brain, then eventually makes those connections, and then he doesn't have to think about it so much. Uh, but there's a lot of stuff that comes in on that, even if we're doing practical things. Uh, this is that kind of friction between structured learning and experimental learning, mm -hmm. of course. Um, and uh, for a lot of the dogs I work with who struggle with social engagement around other dogs, other people have heard me mention this before, but um, a lot of the time, I see a dog who's actually has been screaming for a long time. Give me time. Yeah. I can't deal with this social engagement because I can't process it in my way that I need to. And that means the brain starts to have a belief then around social engagement comes first. You can't process in enough time. Mm -hmm. And I think this is where trying to find more about that dog's own story is really helpful when we start thinking, right, what is it this dog needs? Or how do we need to reframe using your 
word is great. I love that refrain. Uh, how can we reframe this so that you can do this? And you're right. You know, we can right. we can manage environment to a point. Even when I was working with humans who might have social social sensitivity, social anxiety, mm -hmm. uh, you just don't know what's going to be in the environment. You know, and, and you just got to try and build some resilience and some better cognitive structure. To be able to deal with these things but we can manage environment to a point uh we can manage behavior to a point but ultimately that rear cognitive reappraisal i'm gonna keep saying that because i love the way you frame it uh is is ultimately is what's really important and and the best way is about slowing things down we almost need to kind of stop rewind and then start off again in a different set of gears really um, yes yeah and I, I often do exactly that, exactly what you just described. Um, you, you give the dog a recuperative period where you're not flooding them with a stimuli, environmental stimuli that they clearly don't have the coping skills to deal with, right? You're, you're just allowing them to, giving them a recovery period where they can chill out, uh, you know, that's when I do mat training as a relaxation response, not an obedience behavior. Uh, for me, mat training is not go to place. I And I teach almost everything I do with dogs as a default, non-cued behavior, because I do think one big problem, and this is a kind of combining the practical with the, um, you know, with the more cognitive elements is that many dogs have been overtrained and over dependent on cues, right? If a dog is over dependent on cues, they don't learn to problem solve independently. What they do, and I, I mean, I, I want my dog to trust me and to be able to rely on me, that's part of the social contract I have, but I don't want my dog to, every time they get into a stressful or concerning situation, depend on me to tell them what to do. Like go settle, be quiet, watch me. <laughs> I mean, these basic cues, but I think in a, in a really fundamental way, what they have done is not given dogs the independent default coping mechanisms that they need to be able to go into a new environment, for example, where, and I, so I just, a, a short aside, I live in a university town and it tends to be very progressive. So I do a lot of training down in our kind of city park, dog park, and you see everything. Um, one typical, um, uh, I, I guess, new stimuli for many dogs is like a bicycle built for three. I just saw that the other day when I, I was down in the parking lot and had that dog seen a bicycle built for three? No, he had didn't have a clue what it was. Um, so maybe six months ago, if I see something like that, and guess what? It's moving and it's got spokes where the light is reflecting off of it and people are making noise. It's a perfect trigger stacking mechanism, right? Um, six months ago, this dog would have had a meltdown, barking, lunging, screaming, pulling, you know, at the end of the leash. But the other day, what he did was he took a deep breath because that's another one of my fundamental, and I call it thinking, thinking is breathing, breathing is thinking. <laughs> Slow thinking, you know, take a breath, take a deep breath. Um, and I want dogs to offer it every time they see something new that concerns them because you can't stop the concern. You know, if I see something new that I totally don't understand, I'm probably gonna feel a little stressed about it or at least, you know, maybe scared. What, what is that? Um, 
that you you really cannot stop and that's the reflexive part of it that's the neurobiology of it that you're talking about andy but i what i want to do is um interrupt that fast twitch thinking sequence where i see something new and i immediately because it's so deeply and habitually ingrained launch into a self-defensive behavioral routine <laughs> Barking, lunging, biting, pulling my human over, redirected, I mean, you name it, every, every piece of that has happened. No, when I see something new and I don't understand it, I don't wait for my human to tell me what to do. I use what I've learned. I take a deep breath. I try to problem solve. I also many times take portable mats with me. I get on my mat, my safe space of relaxation. Um, so I think there are many ways of slowing things down. And, uh, you know, it's not that we want to get rid of fast thinking. If you did, you could not live. You really literally could not live. But I think in these situations, um, it, it, it comes to just be so dysfunctional, so stressful. And I, you know, so uh, I, I think there, there are many, many different ways to teach slow thinking and cognitive reframing reappraisal. But that to me is like the number one goal. And I think, um, again, quite a few things just to unpack there because, um... Like you say, there's lots of different ways, and this is where we have to start with finding that story for the dog in front of us, their truth, what bits of these components are, what it is that they're struggling with. Uh, this is why I think um, when we think about Laura Dobb uh, with her slow, slow dog Absolutely. movement, uh, when yes. we think about free work with Ace, when we think about um, a lot of the stuff that has kind of olfactory elements to it, uh, when we think about... Um, uh, you know, enrichment, uh, Shay and his enrichment group. Uh, if anybody hasn't seen that on Facebook, check that out. Check out Slow Dog Movement on Facebook. Check out Ace Connections on Facebook for the free work. All these things, even out of context, they're allowing a dog to start processing in a way that is connected to them. And, and I, see a, I see a connection, Laura. This might be a little bit controversial, but when I think about the structured education, so this is kind of alluding to what you said at the beginning of, of what you said there. If we think about the structured education system for us humans, which is very arbitrary in nature, there's a lot of <clears throat> pressure on what are our expectations regarding behavior, uh, what results look like, um, there being this kind of external makeup regarding that rather than what is actually internally valuable, going back to that again. <clears throat> we see a lot of children go through a structured education system um, who, who can't connect to that process, who stop being able to find that authentic way to be able to elevate and decompress, to be able to rationally work through their own things. And that causes a lot of issues for those children. And when we think about with dogs, especially from puppies, because we have a heavy operant approach from the moment we get those puppies, we're already doing loads of training. We're doing loads of connections. We're making a connection with food, which is about them giving behaviors that we want to see. Uh, we're making, uh, but without a, such an important time in their life, again, Kathy will, uh, can, can, will tell us more on this about their kind of the neuroplasticity of young pups uh, and what mother nature's actually equipped them with neurologically to be able to process and work things out and have some kind of internal value, we risk taking away those opportunities and just like we do with human kids, right? By having a heavy structured system around them, we, we don't allow enough experimental learning for these dogs where they can build resilience and, um, uh, and um, uh, more resilient cognitive processing. Absolutely. I mean, I, I totally agree with that. And it's a huge change. This is this is uh, where we, you know, we're going to get back to some of what we talked about in the very beginning, and because this is a huge change for most humans, dealing with 
um, issues of aggression, most people think the way to go is more obedience, more cues, more, more of a problematic kind of structure, because I use structure all the time. But uh, not, not in terms of more micromanagement uh, of, you know, my dog's thinking processes. And, that, and that's what I mean by um, oh, be, being overly dependent on cueing. Well, and, that, and that actually unites positive reinforcement people with more people who use more, because they're all using cueing. It's different, different kinds of cueing. Um, and obviously I absolutely prefer the, the positive reinforcement cueing, but I think clicker training can, for example, um, and, and too much dependence on cueing the dog can actually um, stunt I, uh, for want of a better word, the dog's ability to develop independent problem solving skills, the coping mechanisms, the cognitive processing mechanisms that would allow them to go into a new environment or see the same old threatening, scary stuff and be able to reframe it in a way that allows them to feel better. <laughs> You know, that that is the bottom line. And that feel better, that's the most important thing, right? Because under all this stuff, you know, the, the brain is important because um, like I said before, yeah, we don't hear with our ears, we hear with our brain. It depends on what our brain makes of what we hear, that whether it has puts value onto it or not, or what it makes of it. Um, but ultimately the, the brain, uh, we have to feel, you know, so those emotions are important and, and uh, trying to work out that kind of, aspect for the dog especially when a lot of these dogs have part of the presentation i think i think for me there's there's um there's two dogs that i see there is the dog that i feel right outside the box is is uh, you know mother nature has already put that dog on, on the more sensitive end of the spectrum mm -hmm. and then that dog especially has been fail for want of a better word by the structured system because there's a mm -hmm. part that wasn't picked up on they were just going through the motions mm -hmm. i see the same in humans right the same thing with these kids in school who are a bit more sensitive about stuff and then of course those dogs who have experienced trauma many of them have and that trauma is not as simple as um we've got uh, rachel leather coming on uh soon to talk about trauma uh in more detail but uh, i think um this comes back to that dog's own truth their own story and uh, you know, trauma just isn't about trying to arbitrarily get new behaviors that we want to see. Uh, it isn't about uh, having a process that has an end goal that is based on our narrative. It is about trying to find what that dog can process and work through and cognitively replays, as you say, and get to a certain point that's, that's real for that dog. And that in itself might shift over time. Uh, you know, even in human uh, therapy, we don't kind of see things as being okay yeah so in you know three months time this will be the case it's a case of right we're just going to keep moving through and then because people hopefully can start to have these coping strategies that are um more innately driven now and that chance to be able to like say take a breath i love that because we talk about that a lot just take a breath mm -hmm. and then just stop that initial quick thinking and just think about it i'm mm -hmm. working with a lady at the moment who's um very anxious with her anxious dog and every dog that she sees, she feels she has to put the dog on the lead and move away. Uh, and she's doing a lot of this slow thinking herself now, Laura, because I've been out with her and I've, I've invited her to kind of see that dog coming, take a breath and actually look and see what the facts are in front of her. Oh, it's some old ploddy Labrador walking with her owner. Where is the threat there? There isn't right now. Mm -hmm. It mm -hmm. just takes that moment. Um, but um, uh, yeah, so, so uh, with dogs, we again, we have this kind of view that yeah, this kind of protocol, you know, within six months, you'll be in this place because mm -hmm. that's where we're looking at. Who says we have to be in that place? As long as we can get the client to really recognize the dog's emotionality as part of that journey and also look at their own belief system, which is really important that we connect with that and shift that if needs be so they can see the actual care needs. Because the reality is, I'm sure you found this with 
dogs you work with, Laura, some of these dogs will never be able to be fully exposed to some, some of these situations. They'll be able to cope better with lesser than events. Oh, so yes. Oh, yeah. And uh, developing, I, 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 I think I know we've said this probably in every conversation that we've had. And, and, and that is one of the most important gifts we can give to our dogs and ultimately ourselves is to let go our expectations. Let go of those expectations. Uh, some are wildly unrealistic, uh, such as the person I worked with whose dog had delivered a level, a level four bite to a neighborhood uh, teenager, right? And so I talked to her, well, what are your, what, what are your goals for your dog? Clear she hadn't really um, thought about it in those ways, but she held on to the expectation that, you know, I would really love him to be a therapy dog, a therapy dog. And I, you know, I just, <laughs> no way is this dog ever going to be a therapy dog and actually pushing him to be one will probably be his undoing. And I think this is, uh, this is another area, isn't it? I think I, I've worked with uh, quite a few dogs recently who have been given as therapy dogs. Uh, and a lot of the frictions have come because of the dogs, the, the dog can do the training side of things, but the inability for that dog to find good decompression after mm. doing the work. And, and, and if this comes back to something that I, I've discussed with uh, Kim about the term alignment, trying to find some alignment between mm. those expectations and the realities. But this is why I think we have to, we have to educate more about the human psychological process. I'm going to be running a little course for care for professionals on this soon when I get my act together, um, because I think it's important that we understand the role of belief systems, how they're protected by the cognitive biases. Because once we have that belief system, the brain wants to stick with that. I say the brain doesn't like having to rethink stuff very much. So you have that belief system, the dominance model, I believe that. That's my belief, you know, mm -hmm. that's how I see my dog's behavior, whatever it is. Uh, you will then get those cognitive biases, the belief filters, if you like, they're gonna protect that. Uh, that then leads to expectations based on that belief, mm -hmm. which then leads to judgment <clears throat> about the behavior of others, which then leads to the need to want to control and coerce and change. And then the last bit of that process is then we create language around that to support all that. So yeah. We have to recognize that we all do it. This is the point. Where once we step back and think, right, once we step back and understand the process, it allows us then to rethink ourselves a little bit and we have to recognize this process of belief systems and filters and biases and all these things and the language we use for ourselves first because when we go in that's why i've got my cake analogy the compassion awareness mm -hmm. knowledge empathy because it's a really good thing to think right i'm going to see you you've already said on the phone or whatever that you know you've used aversives or you believe in the dominance model or whatever it is you've told me your story that belief system is 180 away from mine and what I think you should have to be a good carer for mm -hmm. this dog. But I have to start with compassion. I have to think, right, I'm not going to go mm -hmm. in there and shame you or point fingers at you or make you feel uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. So we have to learn these psychological constructs for our own self and then also to understand, okay, how do I understand this so I can best access that belief system and shift it? And I think we need more education on that in the industry, really, because... Uh, when we think about this, there's always three types of people. Uh, some people listening, I would have heard me said this before, I know. But, um, but for those who haven't, there's going to be those who share your belief system. And that's really easy. They're really easy to work with, right? Because they already get it. And, and there's mm. not much a big shift there. The other end of the spectrum are those whose belief system is 180 away from you. Um, and we've got to recognize that some people, regardless of what you do, you may never, they might not be in the right place now to hear that message and to do that reappraisal and to shift that. Mm -hmm. Most of the ones in the middle are up for it, though, as long as we do it the right way, especially those who are closer to that end. What we say and what we do when we first meet those clients is really important to help shift that belief system a little bit. Because if we don't, if we're not aware of this, this is how polarization happens. And that's our industry, right? Mm -hmm. 
I'm balanced. I'm force free. Uh, yeah. I voted for Trump. I didn't. I voted yeah. for Brexit. I didn't. Because it's just the entrenchment of those belief systems. Yeah. Got to think more about this, I think. And especially with the stuff that you're talking about. How can we get the dog to be able to be exposed to things in different ways so that they can have a different thought process and allow them to take that breath and allow them the chance to be able to process in a more authentic way for them? If we can't get the carers to. Well, I. It can be hard. It's not impossible. It's, it can be hard, right? Well, I think you, because you, you have to work on uh, both, you know, many, many um, parts of the partnership together. Uh, it's a team effort. But I do think, uh, you know, what I've, what I've experienced over and over and over. And I'll just say, you know, I'm, I'm not a person who really wants to give up my expectations. <laughs> that, that's not one of my strong suits in life, giving up my expectations. Um, and I've had to deal with that over, you know, the, the course of my lifetime. But I do think our expectations human expectations get in the way of hearing our dog stories. Hugely, and each other's, this is the thing. Yeah, yes. those patients start with a belief. It's a belief system that creates an expectation now that has to support that. And, um, you know, this is the bigger discussion that we need as an industry, because of course, on the one side, we are seeing a dog in front of us, who in my opinion is already the victim, if you like, of all this stuff that we know we've got to rethink because that dog's already been through it and they're already in that situation. And especially living in a zeitgeist that is still mm -hmm. dominance model, behavior bad, that there must be a consequence for bad behavior. Mm -hmm. We've got to change the beliefs to start changing those expectations. But we don't have very realistic expectations of each other. And we don't even have very good realistic expectations of ourselves sometimes. You know, it can be hard. Uh, you know, if we believe that success looks a certain way and especially in our industry there's so many out there especially the kind of influencers saying well if you're not doing this this and this you're not successful if mm -hmm. you start to believe that your expectations become unrealistic for yourself so understanding this kind of hierarchy of belief system cognitive biases expectations judgments and then finally language we have to start at language in my opinion so in my opinion to kind of work back through with that person so mm -hmm. how we talk about things and I think this is something else where the opera model lets us down a little bit, because whilst we all can geek out about quadrants and discuss things and fall out about things and, and talk about methods and tools, it isn't necessarily doing anything language wise to shift what we do need to shift to, which is thinking about the dog's individual emotional experience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I say individual as well, because, uh, you know, the breed thing is a big blockade for us because it's bad enough with the word dog, because for a long time, well, a dog's a dog, right? Mm -hmm. And then we've got breed. Oh, yeah, but he's a Labrador, right? Mm -hmm. No, he's a Jack Russell, right? Mm -hmm. um, with, it just stops us from thinking, yeah, but hang on, it, it doesn't matter that there's a dog. It doesn't matter he's a Labrador. It matters that it's Harley, a unique individual who has everything that that dog has gone through to that second in their life has contributed to that cognitive and nervous system process. Yeah, yeah. And I you see that, don't we, with people say, well, I've had dogs all my life. That's the, that's the <laughs> thing, that their belief system, they, and it's genuine, they, they genuinely believe, yeah. but I know dogs because I've had lots. Mm -hmm. um, and I always remind them, yeah, but you haven't had this one mm -hmm. before. That's it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I think that, that um, that's part of the difficulty in labeling and then the expectations that come with labeling um, and, and I, I do think being able to hear a dog story, um, actually one, one of my biggest challenges has been working with a dog's humans to um, convince them that yes, your dog can think. Your dog can think independently you know, if you, if you just wanted a dog that you could, uh, to use the, the language 
dominate or tell what to do. Well, just get a robotic dog. Don't get a sentient, emotional, real, you know, real life dog who has awesome cognitive powers that we know are on a parity with those of human. Th that, that is where I think we need to go. Um, because once you believe that your uh, partner, your canine partner, your member of the family can think, feel in their, in their own particular way, not, not thinking is not the same as cognition. Um, that, I mean, humans think in a different way, but we have cognitive powers that are very, very similar. The neurobiology, everything about it is very similar. And when you come to believe that you have an emotional sentient partner with awesome cognitive abilities, there are many things that just become impossible or should be. Uh, should be. I mean, for example, on the Pet Professional Guild listserv recently, there, there's a whole thing about Jeff Gelman. And I know Jeff Gelman, the bonking, you know, if a dog jumps, I'm gonna, I'm gonna hit it. Bonking with a big um, uh, kind of a balloon filled with air that can actually hurt and cause damage. It's a terribly abusive uh, strategy, but he's marketing it as behavior change. Tried to come to the UK. Thankfully he was banned and Scotland and, and banned, but he's still going strong, right? And so what I wanna say, not to some, not to Jeff Gelman, because I just think his belief system is too ingrained. <laughs> But to the people who are enabling him, who are going, who are taking their dogs to the Jeff Gelmans of this world, um, you know, I, once you believe that your dog is a thinking partner, is a feeling partner, uh, who is a problem solving partner, um, how can you do this? You can't. Uh, I think you're right. I think if you can change people's belief systems enough, then a lot of the discussions become a bit more mute. Yes. Because they, um, uh, we don't have to try and navigate around tools and methodologies because they can see, you know. Um, and actually, I find a lot of caregivers, Laura, that I work with are waiting for this message, actually. that The, the, the resistance comes from uh, other colleagues. Uh, and even more actually from colleagues on the force free side of the industry interestingly you have a bit of an opera bias they find some of these discussions for some reason i don't know a little bit threatening but in fact it's it's the most purest way of telling people don't hurt your dog mm -hmm. uh which is you know because because you don't because you know of understanding where that reframing that dog's behavior but uh, it's almost that dogs are the last bastion really of a human <coughs> Flaw, what you want to call it, flaw, but a human pro problem with the human condition. Hubris. Because, sorry? <laughs> Hubris. Hubris, yes. <laughs> um, uh, because uh, humans, we're, 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 we have this, coming back to that structure again of belief systems and the needs and expectations and judgments, we have a whole society based around that. Mm -hmm. uh, it wasn't that long ago, and it still is the case, sadly, uh, in, in many areas where women, expectations and judgments were put on women and their behavior and what they should do and men's feeling of control and power and what needed to be done. And, and over time, we, the women have, have increased their own voice and broken away from some of those expectations and judgments. Same with children, you know, the kind of expect, expectations and judgments and control put on children and different areas in society, especially minority groupings. We're kind of talking about the same freeing up of our relationship with our dogs, really, that actually we need to rethink this completely we're not even talking about one little area thinking about oh, that little bit of what we do needs to change for me it's everything needs to change um we need to free ourselves up uh, and allow a more connected 
but authentic process for the individual dog uh, and recognizing ethology and recognizing what mother nature might have already pre-described for that dog regarding what their sensitivities and sensibilities are. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's important we have that kind of discussion. So Laura, um, well, that's flown by, hasn't it? That's really flown by. Uh, <laughs> what, um, what kind of closing thoughts would you like to share with everybody regarding of what you feel we need to really focus on now or what we need to be thinking or what what's part of your vision for moving forwards well part of part of my vision i i think the big philosophical you know what you're talking about andy is changing the great chain of being right that's the philosophical metaphor that has driven a lot of exactly what we're talking about and we homo sapiens is at the top right? And everyone has different rungs they occupy below that. Um, that's one thing. I, I actually, um, I, I'm a person who loves theory. I love theory. But what I really want to do is change the everyday life of dogs and their humans. That's why my commitment is to uh, try to develop a program, develop uh, strategies, help people understand things that will change what I call everyday dog training. My everyday life of what I'm doing with my dog, whether I'm a professional or uh, am a human partner in, in just a household arrangement with a dog. Um, so I, Most of my effort has been on what can I do in in practical terms? How can I help people learn, for instance, how to teach their dogs, how to enable their dogs to develop these slow thinking, um, problem solving abilities. And I've tried to incorporate that into my everyday behavior consulting with people and it's one reason why um, I, I am offering a webinar next month. Uh, and I think the announce, I put the announcement on the care, uh, dog centered care website so people can go to that. I'll put another link up. If you put a link in, if you put a link in the comments on this, uh, yeah. on this thread, that'd be yeah. great. Yeah. And, the, and the, the title is Slow Thinking is Life Saving for Dogs. But The subtitle is why it's important and how to teach it. It's that how to teach it part. You know, I I think the having the philosophical conversations is so important, but then I want to know what, what I can do differently in my everyday life while I'm letting my dog out into the backyard, for example, what can I do differently about that? Or in my case, what can I do differently when my own two dogs are going at it that's going to change their life and change mine for the better? And I think that's really important, isn't it? It's, uh, we get so focused on the context of the issue in front of us without backing up and looking at other ways that we can get our dogs to connect in different scenarios, which are just as important as, as those acting as those building blocks. Yeah, when we start to re-expose them to the thing that we were coming back to. Uh, one last little question: You've, um, I know, uh, you know, you've taught at virtually all the big conferences and summits and events. You've spoken at the Lemonade Conference, um, uh, Victoria Stillwell Geek Week. You've done, you do it all. Really. When you talk on these terms to the kind of mainstream industry and community, what kind of what kind of response have you had? Well, uh, you know, I assume that the people who really hate it and and (laughs) and don't want any, you know, are probably not going to post on my Facebook page. But given the 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 world we live in, they they that's the first thing they might do. I don't know. Um, I I can only say I, I think like you, a huge sigh of relief from people. Also, it opens up a whole new way of relationship, not just with our dogs, but with other animals. I I know uh, 
you know, just recently, yesterday, there was a posting on your uh, on your Facebook page about slime having cognitive <laughs> power. And of course, we all know about the octopi, octopus have awesome cognitive abilities. So one thing I want to do is actually shift people's thinking from the kind of great chain of being model that emphasizes certain forms of linguistic thinking as being superior, privileged, um, you know, we're at, we're at the top of the being chain, to cognition, which many other life forms share. A and in some cases, they have cognitive powers that are fairly on, a, on, a, on an equal scale with humans, because we're talking about information processing, problem solving, decision making. Uh, so uh, that's one practical area that unites the philosophical with the everyday. Changing the discourse to emphasize more the cognitive processes rather than we think and they don't. And also the notion that just because a human thinks in a certain way, that is the only way that, that exactly. it can be done. And, and we've yeah. looked at all the when you look at all the research with birds, especially COVID, so uh, you know, we're discovering different parts of their their kind of how they process without having a cortex like we do, that they, they don't need that. They have their own bird way of doing it. That, that slime blob. Yeah had its own way of doing it. And I think um, it's a very humbling experience. You know, I, I heard uh, a great uh, talk recently by a, um, a kind of a, a guru, Svengali type gentleman. Uh, and it, he said, you know, if all the insects disappeared off the planet today, within months, the planet would die. If all the humans disappeared off the planet today, the, within a few months, the planet would thrive. And I think we have to be just remind ourselves that actually the thing that gets out of hand is our is our human ego and our uh, um, we've got to step back from that somehow. And that's part of this conversation about dogs, really recognizing how we've built a story around dogs that is based upon the human narrative. Mm -hmm. We've got to start giving the dogs a voice now and find out what their reality is more. So I think, um, well, Laura amazing and uh, i'm hoping the feedback today will be good uh, and um uh, and i'm sure it will be but uh so how can people find you then laura how can they find more about your work well i think you can go to my facebook page it's just under my name just google me i can put a link for it uh yeah. if you're interested in this i would encourage people to sign up for the webinar it's 2 hours so it's not going to be it's a deeper dive than I've been doing, but uh, the big element of that is going to come in the fall when I actually offer my course, Slow Thinking is Life-Saving for Dogs. And that is going to go into the everyday, okay, how do I teach my dog to be a slow thinker? And what can I learn from that too? Um, and so I, I think going to my Facebook page, signing up for the webinar, um, I have some articles that might be useful because I talk about cognitive processing in dogs, especially in relation to aggression issues. Um, I talk about in, in my Behavior Matters article, also talk about the limitations of counter conditioning in animals um, and what might be missing that could make that more effective more effective as a technique. Um, so there are a lot of different ways, but I, I, I'm really grateful to have the, I always love talking with you, Andy. And I, I told people, you know, this is totally unscripted. So it means it's going to be wild. Who knows what's going to happen, <laughs> where we're going to go with it. it. So we've deconstructed the great chain of being. We, <laughs> You know, we it, this should have like world changing potential. Our conversations. <laughs> well, we definitely, that's a lot, I think. So that's really good, and, and it'll be great to have you back 
uh, and we can uh, we can talk more, uh, Laura. But thank you so much for your time. And um, I know loads of people in the group have just said how great it is that people are willing to kind of give their time and share their passion and knowledge. And uh, and thank you for that. Well, wonderful. Thank you, uh, Laura. And I will speak to you soon. And thank you, everybody who tuned in. Thank you for everybody who didn't watch the football or maybe <laughs> had the foot maybe had the football on in the corner uh, and listened to this as well. And uh, I'll see you all soon. Take care. Bye.